Um, I just wanted to give a, a quick final brief thing. Um, if it's not obvious already, we spend a lot of time on a uh, hyperlog log and a stick value counter. And my background is in physics. And every once in a while, you see a thing like uh, electrodynamics or classical field theory, which is just a beautiful set of mathematics. And anybody that's spent sort of a significant amount of time with hy the hyperlog log paper, you kind of get that same feeling from it. it. It's shocking that it works. You read it and you're like, that's not possible. I mean, maybe the academic guys think it's cool, but when, when I first read it, there was no way that this could possibly work. Um, and when you, and then it works and you see something like that and you kind of get interested in the author. So we spend a lot of time, you know, we're, we're kind of nerds and we have, we have pictures of, of Philippe Flagellet in our office. Um, and we just kind of wanted to get a sense for who he was as a person and, and what he, and he passed away in 2011. So, um, we actually, Rob and, and Simone, when we were at a ACM Soda this year, bravely walked up to Robert Sedgwick and, and asked him uh, who, who, he would, who he could recommend to help us with, with some of our uh, algorithmic work. And he recommended uh, Jeremy Lombroso, who's going to give a, a little talk about Philippe. And um, he kindly sent over a draft of the log log paper. Um, and this is a handwritten note from, from Philippe in the margin here. And I don't know what this is really referencing, but, but I think it's hilarious because my, my comment would be, would be, he circles maple and goes, Jesus. And, and that's what I would do if I saw that. <laughs> but but maybe, maybe, it's the, maybe it's the integral that comes out of maple that is, is his Jesus. I, I don't know, but it's, it's a really funny thing, and it kind of gives you a sense uh, into who he was as a person and, and his contributions to uh, streaming and sketching algorithms, which are only a small part of his contribution to the world. Um, so I think this is a, a, a cool thing to see, and I'm really looking forward to Jeremy's talk. And he's also fresh off a plane from Paris, so it's like two in the morning for him, so uh, kindly welcome him. Thank you. So I talk here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, actually not. <laughs> I'm more um, let me make sure that, the, that it shows. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, this is why I don't want to use my own computer, because it's much better having somebody else do this than you stressing over it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Timo. And, and thank you for all of you for still being here and for bearing with me with the last talk of the day. Um, if you want to go get a cup of coffee, uh, feel free. So um, I'm Jeremy Lombroso, and we're going for this last talk, we're going to maybe take a little step back. And instead of talking about uh, more technical stuff, I'm going to try to brush you a picture of how these streaming algorithms, in particular the log-log family of algorithms, have come to be. What were their first motivations? Because they began out of applications instead of theory, and how did they evolve on uh, 20 years? So just first a quick slide to show you who Philippe Flagellet is, in case you don't know. Philippe Flagellet so is this early man at the bottom of the, the slide here. And his main domain of research was analysis of algorithms. Um, so analysis of algorithms in the beginning, of course, was um, worst case analysis. You know, you can think of the AHO and Opcroft and type stuff that were the first algorithms books and had analysis that was the big O notation. And in the 1970s, Knuth started asking um, what was not the worst case, but the average case complexity of algorithms. And that started a whole new um, way of thinking. And of course, the next step in that was 1980, when Rabin introduced randomness in the computations. And so Philippe Flagellet was more interested in the average case analysis of algorithms and of giving very precise complexities up to constant factors instead of hiding everything under a big O factor. And so he has a wide scientific production, two books, Analysis of Algorithms and Analytic Combinatorics with Robert Sedgwick, more than 200 publications, 
And he's remembered especially for founding the domain of analytic combinatorics, which is the study of algorithms and of algorithmic structures using complex mathematics. So the two don't seem like they would be related in some kinds, but that's the domain where they are related. And so we're going to talk about him today because he's the one that published the very first sketching streaming algorithm. So you're very familiar with this model, but just to familiarize with my notations, uh, you have a stream, the data streaming model is you have a big stream, which as we said is very, very large. And the kicker is that the domain on which the stream is expressed is also very large. And you, if you take a step back, you can see, and you've seen, you've assumed that you've seen every element in the stream, you can see it as a multi-set where you have elements m1 through m small n, which are repeated f1 to fn times. And you're interested in estimating uh, following quantitative statistics, the length, the number of distinct elements, or the frequency moments, and the constraints, as you know, are very little processing memory. Everything has to be on the fly, no statistical hypothesis, and accuracy within a few percentiles. So the historical context is, is the following. Um, in 1970s, as, as I just said, there was the average case analysis where um, you would analyze algorithms on random inputs. Instead of taking the worst possible input, you would say, what is just a typical input? And that already started um, analyzing algorithms with probability distributions behind it. Then in the 70s, uh, late 70s, you have the first randomized al algorithms with primarily testing Rabin's algorithm, matrix multiplication, uh, finding nearest neighbors. And in 79, you have a very important paper by Munro and Patterson, which is finding the median in one pass and square root of n with high probability. And that's almost the first streaming algorithm, except that, um, <clears throat> except that it, it, well, except for a few technical reasons, which I won't go into. And so in 1983, probabilistic counting by Flagellet and Martin is more or less the very first streaming algorithm in the sense that it's an algorithm that works in one pass and it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have memory that is square root of n, but it's sub um, linear and it's constant or logarithmic. And that's, uh, it ended up being one of Philippe's most highly cited papers. So in the 70s, IBM um, was looking to, to go from their storage columns uh, system into a relational database. And for these relational databases to be as efficient as what they had before, they had to create, uh, to compile queries, right, into something that was very efficient. And this compilation had to involve choices on how to um, how to go through the values, how to go through the columns, how to go through the eight attributes. And to show you a very simple, stupid example, um, if you have a table which lists all the participants uh, at a conference, for instance at this one, and you want to select the name of all the participants which are male and come from France, then if you go through the names of everybody and you first select a subset of all the people that are male, you're going to probably um, keep one half, and that's not quite true in this particular meeting. You're probably going to select one half of the participants, and then if you select on France and you have a whole international conference, you're going to keep like maybe a 20th or a 30th. So it would be better to first look on the nationality, so you skim your set much more, and then to look on the sex, and that way you do a lot more, a uh, lot less comparison. Um, and so the guy that was interested in, in sort of how to approximate, so this is basically um, why am I telling you about sex and nationality, because what I'm saying is that the cardinality, the number of distinct values that the sex can take is much lower than the number of distinct values that the nationality can take. So that's where it ties into optimization. And so this guy that you see pictured on the, the right, Nigel Martin, um, was working on how to approximate the cardinality and so he was sort of looking if I hash things here and if I do this and that I, I find a sort of algorithm 
and his algorithm was lying there. Nobody knew if it quite worked. Um, people said maybe we should look at it at some times, but nobody really knew what tools to look at it because it, it sounded a little bit like, well, I don't want to say garbage, but unproven, unproven algorithm. And so what happened is that Philippe Flagellet had a, a sort of a, a research visit at IBM San Jose in 81, and he was given by this guy Wong, the, his advisor at the time, he was given Nigel's, um, Nigel's uh, note, note up, right up, and he was said, can you tell me if this makes sense, if we should use this, if it works? And Philippe looked at the pages and he was absolutely astounded and this is what he wrote to uh, Nigel Martin in the letter he says as I said over the phone I started working on your algorithm when Q, Yu, Q Young Wang considered implementing it and wanted explanation estimations I find it simple elegant and amazingly powerful so that was an 81 and and so now we're going to enter um, the the ideas of how of the how the working algorithm though you probably are very familiar with it so hashing is a way to um, do reproducible randomness and how did we start using hash functions for these sort of algorithms well in the 50s hash functions were tools for hash tables and not teaching you anything new and I don't know if you're familiar with the literature from that time but hash functions were built usually on a per case basis like you had phone numbers so you wanted to have a hash functions which would chop up phone numbers and sort of put them evenly into uh, a set of buckets or you had the names in, um, in a agenda or something and you would want to make another hash function which would chop those up and put them in buckets eventually people got good at not making hash functions for a particular set of data but making hash functions which were good at spreading any sort of data and so people started thinking of them as probabilistic tools and so that came around with in 1969 when bloom filters appeared and they were the first ones that that considered that okay hash functions spread out data maybe it's not perfect but since we're just going to have um, um, set uh, approximation membership that's okay and actually the first application of bloom filters I don't know if any of you know was for hyph hyphen uh, to hyphenate uh, words in a, in a text and in 77 79 Carter and Wegman published a very influential paper universal hashing and this was the groundstone for a lot of work that came afterwards because it was the first mathematical proof that maybe Perfect uniform uniformizing hash functions don't exist, but here is how you can build them in theory. So even if they're like a unicorn, they can be built. And so that gave vindication to people for using them in these sorts of algorithms. So hash functions can be seen as black boxes, which take any sort of data, whatever it is, and transforms it into random variables. Either a set of infinite bits, which are um, random with probably one half, or a set of real random variables, and um, and that's equivalent, of course. And to show you what it does, I have sort of nondescript plots that show a whole bunch of data moving up and down, and then something pretty uniform on the right. And I like to stress that Philippe's approach was not theoretical at all, but it was very experimental. His approach was not. Do I have hash functions which are good enough? He would just take data, hash a lot of it, and look at what it would give. And if it worked well enough, he would say, well, that's, that's something I can use. So probabilistic counting, the very first algorithm, how did it work? You had a set of elements. So the stream comes S1, S2, S3, and you hash every element. Okay, so as I said, the hash functions transforms any element into a stream of uniformly random bits. So you expect every bit to be zero or one with probability one half. So now if you look at the prefix of a string of, of random bits, you expect to see the prefix zero with probability one half, the prefix one zero with probability one of quarter, the prefix one one zero with probability one eighth. Basically, if you have a prefix of size k, you have probably 1 over 2 to the k to see it. And so indeed, the probability to see this is 1 eighth. 
So the intuition is that since strings are uniform, prefix patterns appear with the probability I just said. And so seeing a given prefix more than likely means that there are more than two to the k plus one strings in your set. So that's the intuition. Um, and the idea thus is to keep track of the prefixes 1k o that have appeared and to at the end estimate that the cardinality is 2 to the p where p is the size of the largest prefixes of ones that you have seen. And so on the, um, the left you have the, um, a, a nice screenshot of the original write-up that Nigel Martin had and so as you can see there's um, for example, so there's the main idea, but then there's lots of corrections because it doesn't quite work. And Philippe came along and he said, well, this was done like sort of ad hoc corrections, but you can analyze this very precisely with a mathematical model. And you can get to this very funky constant here that when you, um, that allows you to exactly correct the estimates that are given to you by the algorithm and to at the end, spout out the exact end that you're looking for. So to just give you a, an idea, but without going into details, this analysis involved uh, early up something called a Mellon transform, which is this, this integral, which takes a function and integrates it and gets a complex function. And the, the bonus of this, this transform is that it factorizes linear superposition of a base function. So I don't know if I, that probably doesn't mean much. So and, and so another. I'm sorry. We can say that that was the joke of the talk. <laughs> and so the other thing is the function. Of course, it has singularities. Like singularities. Like you can think of the inverse function. You know, and at the zero it goes to infinity. Well, that can be considered like a singularity. So singularity is where a function sort of messes up it goes to it doesn't have a value and messes up and so what's interesting is that the points where a function messes up you're going to be able to look at them and to deduce that your algorithm what its asymptotic complexity is and more generally this is um, you can think of this I don't know if most of you know the master theorem it's what Corman and, and his co-authors uh, called um, the, um, the big theorem to uh, do a recurrency analysis and this allows you to get very precise analysis. So just to show you this is a, a thing that you analyze with Mellon and you can see the periodic nature of the thing. So let's go back to the algorithm. So you have H the hash function, you have rho which is just a function that calculates the size of the longest prefix of ones and the probabilistic counting algorithms is you you have a bitmap initially it's all zeros and um, for all x's of, of uh, your stream, you look at the position row of the hash value in your bitmap and you set it to 1. And at the end, you look at the longest prefix of, of, of 1's in your bitmap and you return the inverse of the constant times 2's to the p and that gives you uh, the value that you want. So for instance, if you have this bitmap, p is equal to 5 and uh, is equal to 2 to the 5 divided by 5, and that's 20. And typically this estimates um, n to one binary order of magnitude off of the exact result, and it's not very accurate, so you have to do something better. And that's where um, a technique called stochastic averaging comes into play. So as have been said in, in, uh, in count sketch, and no, count min, yeah, count min, and all these different uh, nearest neighbors algorithms. A basic idea when one estimate is not precise enough is that you do a whole bunch of them and then you average or you take something. So that's the basic idea. So if you take m different hash values and you do m different bitmaps, you can average them and you get um, a better value by a factor 1 divided by square root of m. But that's not efficient, of course, because if you calculate m hash values, since hash values are costly, then anything you've gained in efficiency is sort of completely lost on the overhead of the hash functions. So the idea is, instead of calculating so many hash functions, we're going to use our hash functions a little bit better and use the hash function itself to divide the elements in m substreams. So you're now going to have m substreams and to determine where to um, 
put a hash value, you're going to look at its first few bits, b1 and b2, and then you're going to use the rest to determine the value. So uh, here I have an example. So if your hash value is 00, b3, b4, then you're going to update the bitmap at index 00, sub 00. So I know you don't like the sub notation, but bear with me. Sub 00, and you're going to update the row of not the, the first few bits, but b3, b4, and you're equal to 1. Or if it's 01, you're going to update that bitmap, etc., etc. And at the end, you're going to re take the average of all those bitmaps. And so we end up to this final theorem, which is, uh, the, the estimator Z, which is um, basically the algorithm of probabilistic counting, is asymptotically unbiased and it has a very good accuracy, which is 078. So concretely, what it means is that it needs M log N memory instead of M exact. And so an example of accuracy is below. And so that's good, but as you've all heard, all these algorithms, the ones that are really famous, are called log log n, and here I just showed you a log factor, so you're saying, well, that must not be the best that you can do. And indeed, it isn't. So, but how did we go from probabilistic counting to log log? So probabilistic counting require, uh, bitmaps requires k bits to count to cardinalities up to n to the k. And reasoning backwards, it is reasonable that when you estimate the cardinality of something like n equals to 2 to the third, you will observe a bitmap that is 1, 1, 1, 0. And remember that the first bit you will see with if n is larger than 2, because it has probably 1 half. The second bit, if it's equal to 1, that means that n is superior to 4, etc., etc. So what if instead of keeping track of all the ones that you've seen, we only keep track of the position of the largest? And that would only require to be an index in the scope of a log n that would only require log log n bits. So, <coughs> in the algorithm that I showed you earlier, we're going to replace all the updates of bitmap i rho h of x equals 1 to bitmap i. No more index, it's just a counter instead of an array, and the max of the, the rho function and what was already in that vector. So I've compared the evolution of a vector of bitmaps with probabilistic counting and of log log. So at the beginning, 0, 0, it would be 1. Then you have a 1 that appears, so it would be 4. Then it would have a 1 here, etc., etc. And you would see that the evolution of log log, the counter gets higher much quicker, and that's where the, the loss in accuracy will come from. So for instance, in this execution, you have, in the first one, you have the, the, the probabilistic counting and log log will have the same value at the end. But imagine that one of the hash values, an outlier of course, will go, is going to come and it's going to hit the, um, have a prefix of size 7. Then in the bitmap, it will set the 7th bit to 1 and probabilistic counting will ignore it because it will know that it's just a fluke. But log log will be affected by that because it will update its, its value to the maximum. And that's where the loss of accuracy that is going to come from. And just a side note, um, this is the distribution of the value of the, vect of, um, the, the log log uh, variable. And I just wanted to, um, to point out that as you can see, even though there's a long tail, which means, which is the outliers that I just talked about, it's very concentrated. And so, the, um, the optimal paper in 2010 of, of, um, of Kane, Nelson, and, uh, and Woodruff uh, basically says that since it's very concentrated, instead of storing the entire value, I'll just store, for every register, I'll just store um, a main value and then an offset. And, and when you've cracked the paper and you've seen the main, the main idea that's in it, it's, it's very, very nice. So we go to super log log. We go to super log log from log log with the basic idea that these values, these outliers, which sort of corrupt an estimation and an algorithm, we're going to try to ignore them. So, um, so in super log log, you have your, 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 um, your substreams, all your values for your substreams. You have some which are around 4 and 5 and 6, and then you have a few that are up to 8 in our previous example, and you're going to know that those largest values, you're going to ignore them. So super log log, you have a threshold, and you say any value that is 70% above the mean of all registers, we're just going to ignore. 
and that's uh, of course algorithmic engineering and by doing this we get an accuracy from 136 to 1.05 which is of course a lot lot better and since it's also an algorithmic optimization it's completely impossible to analyze so you just have to take the word for it that it works and so what comes after super log long well initially in a draft paper that i found from november 2006 um, Philippe and his co-authors co had thought of a name which was duper log log, but I guess they realized later on that it doesn't sound as good as it looked on paper. And so this is the algorithm that was come to be known as, as hyper log log. So what is hyper log log and what was the main um, addition in that one? So <coughs> we, the um, hyper log log, it came by because in 2005, Giroir, a PhD student of Philippe at the time, published a thesis on cardinality estimators based on order statistics. Order statistics is the minimum, the maximum, and the, the second largest element, and all that in between. And it was an idea that had already been looked at in the field, and he developed it, and etc. And so people in the French community, Chassin and Girard, looked at his work and they said, well, um, let's use statistical tools and look at all the possible estimators that you could have that are in that family and look at which one is the best, which kind of, of mean is the best, which kind of etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And they were able to deduce and to prove in very rigorous terms that the best mean to use is the harmonic mean. And initially uh, it was the, and Philippe dismissed it and said yes okay it's just playing with a little 0.2 factor but then it turned out that the simulations were very very good and the question is well uh, the AK people obviously thought that it was very obvious but at the time it took some time to understand why it was good and the reason is that the harmonic mean you know what we were doing by uh, deleting all the values above a 70 percent threshold so sort of like going in there and pointing with the values ourselves the harmonic mean does that automatically and I'm going to show it to you with this graph. So say that you have x1, x2 to xm. The arithmetic mean is this thing and the harmonic mean is this thing. And here is a plot where all values of, of x subs are equal to 20,000, but you have a little um, black sheep here, x sub 32, which we're going to change its value to show how it affects the mean. So if we look at if the value is larger than 20,000, you can see that the, the arithmetic mean really goes way up there. But the harmonic mean sort of at some points just starts to ignore the value. And you can see it in the formula because if the value starts to get really big, then one over that value is going to tend to zero. And so we're going to just say, okay, well, this one is too big. We're just going to drop it from the mean. And so that's exactly what we were trying to do with our threshold before in super log log, which is done to us magically by the harmonic mean here. And so that was the end of an, the end of an adventure, hyper log log, which was developed not for databases, but for telecommunications, because all these algorithms were always developed with somebody behind it that needed to use it. Um, Hyperlog log basically is the best algorithm that you could use in practice for this sort of estimation. And the best thing about it is that since it used the harmonic mean instead of a lot of twigs and tweaks, it's very elegant. It has the best accuracy that you probably can get. And so um, what Philippe really liked is to say that with hyperlog log, he could summarize Shakespeare in like 256 bytes. And so, of course, hyperlog log can be used for classification here. Um, well, never mind. <laughs> so, um, so left out of the discussion um, is that this, of course, these algorithms is not all that Philippe did in, in data streaming. And I'm going to just say a word on elder algorithms that don't fit in this clear narrative. So another algorithm that Philippe worked on that you might have heard of is called approximate counting. Now, approximate counting um, was first actually created by a guy called Robert Morris, which you probably have heard of. And uh, But back when he created it, he created it in a paper and he didn't really give it a name. 
He just said counting a large number of events and that paper largely that was published, I think in ACM transaction, largely went unnoticed because it sounded also like something that was far out there. And it didn't have a really cool name. It didn't have any name at all, even though um, Robert Morris called it logarithmic counter in, in his team. And so Philippe, basically what he did is he found this paper. He thought that it, actually he didn't find it. Nigel Martin gave it to him. And he thought this is a really cool idea. And he gave it a name, approximate counting. And he sort of cleaned up the algorithm, it, the algorithm itself. And ever since he did that, then it was a very highly cited paper and people went back to the original paper. And this paper that I keep talking about without saying what it does, um, answers the question, how is it possible to count up to n with only log log n bits? Which if you are familiar with your information theory sounds like it's not quite possible because to distinguish n states and numbers, you need log n bits. And so the second thing that Philippe worked on, um, which was an algorithm suggested by Wegman for cardinality estimation, but, um, but that was never published by Wegman, is something called adaptive sampling, published in 1989, which was very much ahead of its time because I think it was cited maybe seven or eight times, most of them by Philippe himself. <laughs> And it answers, because it has, a, it has a really vague name, right? Adaptive sampling, you have no clue what it does if I just say that. And it was rediscovered in 2000 by a guy called Gibbons called distinct sampling, distinct sampling, and then it sold like hotcakes. And it answers the question, how do you count the number of elements which appear only once in a stream or only twice in a stream? So the very infrequent elements. We're using only constant size memory, and um, and so I'm going. To, if if I have a little bit of time, do I? Okay, I'm good. I'm going to go into why um, why that algorithm helps with that problem. So we're back to our stream x1 to xl for length with n distinct elements, and you have of course uh, what I call straight sampling, which is what you can you have, you have come as known as you know normal sampling. Um, like you can think of reservoir sampling by Vitter and etc. So a strain sam sample of size m basically is you ch take every element with probability m divided by the whole stream. And so you can end up with something like this thing that, that I have here, a x And the problem with sampling, as has already been mentioned uh, during this day, is that if you have this sample, what can you say about the stream? Well, not much. Like for instance, you can say that A is repeated since it appears only once in the sample, um, the inverse of the probability which is L divided by M times in the stream. But it's impossible to say anything about the, the elements I just talked about which are the elements that appear once or that appeared twice because they are hidden in the mass and it's what we call the problem of the needle in a haystack. So this is the needle and this is the haystack. And of course, since I zoom, you can see it. So it's not so much a problem, but. <clears throat> so with sampling, the idea is that very frequent elements are privileged over rare elements and completely, um, it's completely impossible to see rare elements. So the um, adaptive sampling or distinct sampling is, this, is sampling, but much more democratic because it takes each element with a probability 1 over n, which means that it takes it, each element with a probability which is independent from its frequency of appearance. And so to give you a textbook example, suppose that you have um, a stream which has only ones, so 90, 99, ones, and 1, 2. Well, with straight sampling, you're going to take uh, with probability 99 divide, 90, 999 divided by 1,000, you're going to take 1, and with probability 1,000, you're going to take 2. But with distinct sampling, you're going to take a 1 with probability 1 half, and 2 with probability 1 half. 
There you go. So that's the textbook example. And another thing with the sync sample is that in the way that it works, an element comes into the sample and never leave. Um, once, if an element has is in the sample at the end of the execution, it has been in the sample since the beginning. So you can have the exact frequency of that element. And these two facts make it so that this distinct sampling algorithm is very good for several things. For estimating the number of elements which appear once or twice or three times, etc., etc., and also, more generally, for giving you a histogram of the frequency distributions in your stream. Like you, uh, let's since we're at an ad conference, let's suppose that you um, are looking at the stream of the user clicks on your ads, and you want to have a histogram of the users who have clicked on only one ad or the users who have clicked on only two ads or the users who have compulsively clicked on 2,000 ads, etc., etc. Well, this algorithm allows you to get an approximate histogram of, of these clicks. And so that's the, um, that's the adaptive sampling algorithm that, um, that Philippe introduced. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. And...